Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago. And as you're turning, it's amazing that we are finally back in Exodus. Because the last time we were in Exodus was on April 2nd, Sing to the Lord Part 10. Then we had Palm Sunday on April 9th, King or Rebel, the question of authority. Then Good Friday on the 14th, three days and three nights. Then the Resurrection Sunrise Service on the 16th, the Risen Christ, Convicting, Commanding, and Conquering. And then in the morning worship, the Resurrection and Peace on the 16th. And then last week was Women's Missionary Society Missions Sunday with Brother Keith Coleman, the heart of a missionary. I can hardly believe that a whole month has gone by. And now today we're back on April 30th, Sing to the Lord, Part 11. Sing to the Lord, Part 11. And I hope you remember some of the things we've been studying because we've been studying principles that apply not only to music, but to every aspect of the Christian life. I've covered an awful lot in that, but let me do a quick review of where we concluded on April 2nd. We looked at point number 11, related to music and language. What is the music saying across cultures? And we noted that this was very important because we had just finished talking before that about the offering of strange fire to the Lord, and a lot of music that gets offered in churches is like the strange fire for which Nadab and Abihu were killed by God. Very, very dangerous. And we applied that principle to music by asking some pointed questions, because remember, music is a universal language. No matter what culture you go into, they will understand music where they may not understand the words that you are saying to them. Music transcends culture. It communicates something about the culture and the context in which the music was developed. Yesterday, I heard an interesting discussion on the radio by a world-famous conductor, and I think I told you about that. A fascinating discussion comparing music and colors together. So we need to ask a few questions as how we can get a handle on how to test music. Number one, how was this particular music originally used in the culture where it was originated. How did they use it? Number two, did those who developed these forms use them to glorify God or to worship demons? Many forms that have come into our culture now were originally designed for the worship of demonic forces. In other words, that type of music is strange fire. Number three, even if the particular music did not spring directly out of pagan worship, is it the fruit of that kind of music brought to full bloom. Number four, we talked about the 300 distinct forms and genre of music that are clearly defined and that each have specific elements that set them apart from other forms of music. You know, we th term, tend to think in terms of just sort of a mush of music. There are over 300 distinct forms that can be clearly delineated by people who understand music, that this is this kind of music, this is this kind of music, and so on. Obviously, we can't cover them all, so we have to learn principles for discerning which ones are appropriate for the worship of the holy God. Number five, so how do you know what you can use and what is dangerous to use, keeping in mind doing all for the glory of God, not just being in neutral? And I gave you an illustration of that uh, where we talked about Roman Catholicism penetrating a culture, then taking the cultural idols, dressing them up in robes, and rechristening them with the name of Mary. And we would all agree, I think, that that's a strange fire practice. So I pointed out at that time that there is no difference between taking pagan musical forms that were originally designed to worship the devil and rechristening them with, quote, Christian words. Rock music and all its forms goes back to the demon worship of pagan tribes in Africa, the Far East, Central America, and South America. Just this last week at prayer meeting, I wish you guys would all come to prayer meeting. I've been doing a very important series on how paganism and Hinduism and New Age mysticism and all kinds of occultic practices have crept into the church. But just this last prayer meeting, just four days ago, we saw a DVD on how the charismatic movement has substituted Baal music for true Christian worship in the church. You need to be here on prayer meeting nights, folks. I, I'm sorry you missed it if you weren't there. You need to be there on Wednesday evenings. A church can only move forward on its knees. Prayer meeting is for prayer. Although you're learning a lot of things there in prayer meeting, but it's for prayer, and the church only moves forward on its knees. And with the intensity of the spiritual war increasing around us, and I hope you see that, all of us need to be there. By the way, one other thing before I go on. 
In your bulletin today, there was a, um, an insert. One page is on fighting for life. What would you think that's about? Okay, any pro-life people here? That's about abortion. Okay. On the back side, Christian persecution. It's not only going on in Iraq, and it tells you about it here, and it gives you sources where you can go online and find out more. It's also happening in Mexico. Traditionalist Catholics in Chiapas, Mexico, have given evangelical Christians an ultimatum, convert, flee, or face imprisonment. What's going on in Mexico, just, Mexico, just south of our border? Now I have a question for you. I want you to be honest. Every week, I put inserts into the bulletin that have significant Christian news from around the world for which you as believers should be praying. Now, a question for you. Honesty, honesty, honesty. How many of you always read the bulletin inserts every week? Please raise your hand. Praise God. I got about half the congregation with me on that. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope you pray because the spiritual warfare is intensifying. We're just talking about music and how it intensifies in that area, but it's intensifying all over the globe. A lot of pressure being put on believers, and everybody knows about North Korea, but you know, did you know about Mexico? You all know about Iraq, but do you know what's going on, for example, in Sweden and Norway and Finland? Do you understand what's happening to evangelical Christians in Europe? How about North Africa? How about in certain parts of the United States? Read the inserts. Well, anyway, back to our preaching, enough meddling. Um, but God has given us some very basic principles in Scripture. We, we talked about, we gave you an illustration about uh, the Reformation and how God developed the highest forms of music during the Reformation period. And then those began to expand until we move into the era of uh, great musicians such as Bach and Handel and others around them who were really, going back to Luther and others, instrumental in establishing Biblical principles of music based on scripture. And you can't just say, well, I'm playing my rock music for the glory of God. Uh, so, you know, therefore God has to accept it as such. No, God doesn't have to accept it as such. We gave you an illustration of uh, somebody saying, well, for the glory of God, I think we'll go over and paint graffiti on the public school building because they deny God and teach evolution. And then some other student will say, well, show me in the Bible where it says that it's not for the glory of God because in my mind, I'm doing it for the glory of God. I've decided that I'm doing it for his glory and therefore it is for his glory. That's moronic uh, kind of thinking. Um, or may, they might even say, well, show me a Bible verse where it says thou shalt not paint graffiti on public school buildings. And so since there's no prohibition in the Bible, therefore it's okay. Now, as a basic starting point, I think we would all agree that God has established principles, principles that relate to that issue. For example, violating the property rights of others. Two, generally not violating secular laws since God places human authority over us for an ordered society. The exceptions being, of course, when government commands you to disobey the Bible. Three, the fact that we can reach valid biblical conclusions for life, decisions, and activities without having to have direct commands or prohibitions. Four, the fact that the Bible clearly states both specific things that are, are for the glory of God and specific things that are not for his glory. And by both deductive and inductive reason, as well as by analogy, we can arrive at valid biblical conclusions that give us restrictive categories. And number five, the fact that the example of Jesus and the apostles was to use scripture and biblical principles to counteract error and to defeat their opponents, not just to deface the property of their opponents because they were mad at what they were doing or kill the opponent's donkey because they didn't like what the opponent was doing to show their displeasure with whatever the opponents taught. We have many, many moral principles in scripture like your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God dwells in you. Whosoever defiles the temple of God, him will God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. It's all over the New Testament. That's a principle. It doesn't say thou shalt not smoke, but there's a principle. It does not say thou shalt not use drugs, but there's a principle. Because your body, if you're a Christian, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you do not do certain things that defile the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you get it? Same thing is true with music. 
I'm trying to teach you the principles that you can use so that when you hear a piece of music, you say, does this violate certain principles? And we'll be talking about that in just a little bit. So like the graffiti artist, you might say, well, show me in the Bible where it says that's not for the glory of God to pull out my electric guitar and my drums, paint my hair green, scream into a microphone, some modern translation of the Bible set to rock music. Show me in the Bible where it says that that's not for the glory of God because in my mind, I'm doing it for the glory of God. And since I've personally decided that I'm doing it for his glory with my green hair and my screaming into a microphone, it'll, unintelligible words and wiggling around on the stage and strobing lights on myself and banging away on the drums. Show me where it says that's not for the glory of God. Since it doesn't say that, therefore it is for his glory. Folks, that's a non sequitur. Just because a punk rocker decides that something is so doesn't make it so. I hope you understand that. So let's go back for a minute. That brings us back to the main principle which undergirds all of the discussion, doing all for the glory of God. We look at Colossians chapter 2, or excuse me, chapter 3, verse 23, which says, And whatsoever you do, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Verse 17 gives us further insights. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Thanksgiving is tied in there very much so. I wish we had time to develop that. We're not going to, but there are two key basic elements in verse 23. Number one, do it enthusiastically with all your heart. When you're in the center of God's will, you'll be doing it with all your heart. When you are doing all to the glory of God, you are in the center of God's will. Second, clarify your focus. Keep Jesus Christ in the center. Get rid of the question, what will other people think? You are glorifying the Lord and you are doing it for him alone. Do everything as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ, but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. That's verses 23 through 25, same chapter. Say to yourself, I only care what Jesus thinks. That will focus you. That will keep you from sin. That will keep you from compromise. That will help you to do everything enthusiastically with joy for the glory of God. Verse 17 makes it clear that our words as well as our actions are in view when we do all to the glory of God. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, you do it in his name. And we talked about the name and the authorization, the authority that comes with the name of Jesus Christ. Don't use his name in the wrong manner. Do not abuse the name of the Lord Jesus. Doing all for the glory of God covers every area of interpersonal relationships. We saw that as we read first uh, Colossians chapter 3, that every different interpersonal relationship, husbands and wives, you know, husbands to wives, wives to husbands, parents to children, employers to employees, and so on, they're all covered. All the interpersonal relationships are covered there in chapter 3. And right in the middle of that is verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with greats in your hearts to the Lord. First thing you learn out of that verse is that it has to center around the word of Christ. And it has to be given in wisdom, not in stupid catchphrases, not in mindless repetition like a Hindu mantra. It's supposed to be the word of Christ. It's supposed to be in wisdom. It's supposed to be for the purpose of teaching. It's for the purpose of admonishing one another. And you're doing this with music. That's the context of the verse. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Folks, that verse, we're going to hopefully unpack that over the next few weeks, but I mean that has so much there that tells you what music is not appropriate because it defines what God says is appropriate and anything contrary to that is therefore not appropriate. Doing all to the glory of God covers all interpersonal relationships. Other believers in the church, verse 13, employers and employees, verse 22, husbands and wives, children and parents, fathers in particular and their children, verses 18 through 21. God has given us specific instructions for how we are to do all, including our music, to the glory of God. Every detail of the Christian life is set out for us in scripture because every detail of the Christian life is important to God and it must be according to the revealed will of God for our Christian life, including our music. Music plays a major facet in that truth. 
because it's interpersonal, just like all those relationships that we saw in the same chapter. Music expresses what we believe about living the Christian life. Music expresses what we believe about walking in the spirit. Music expresses what we believe about walking by faith. Music expresses what we believe about salvation. Music expresses what we believe about progressive sanctification and so on. The music we listen to and perform expresses audibly and visibly what we believe about doing every detail in a manner that is in conformity with the revealed will of God for the Christian life. I hope we understand that. We looked at a number of passages about uh, how God reveals his glory. God reveals his glory where he expresses it and then we glorify him by the way we bring glory to him. We saw God manifested his glory to Moses at the burning bush when he declared his covenant name. We saw God manifested his glory to Isaiah in the throne room vision of Isaiah 6 and that is uh, again repeated over in the book of Revelation which I hope we'll study soon. Uh, so let's make some application of these lessons. Stop and think for a minute. Does the music you listen to and perform reflect the kind of glory that we saw at the burning bush? Does the kind of music you listen to and perform reflect the kind of glory that Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6, where I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and it was filled with smoke, and the angels are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And Isaiah said, woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for I have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. An angel came and took a tongs and took a coal off the altar and put it on his mouth to cleanse him. The music that you listen to. Does it reflect this kind of glory? Does it connect you to the glory of the Shekinah radiating around the throne of God? Does it make you bow in humble amazement and worship before the God of heaven and earth? That's why Paul can declare to the Philippians that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. By the way, that's a quotation from Isaiah chapter 45. Paul picks it up and quotes it again also in Romans chapter 14 and verse 11. That brought us to the third key point, how we see how to glorify God through music. The third point was God also manifested his glory to John in the book of Revelation. And we talked about how every chapter in Revelation manifests a different facet of the glory of God. The focus on the glory of God is not only the throne room vision of chapter 4, but throughout Revelation, the glory of God inspires awe and wonder. We saw that in chapter 15, chapter 21, chapter 21, 23, multiple places. I'm not going to read all those verses again. Other ways in which God is glorified, God is glorified when the word of God is glorified. In the music you listen to, is sound doctrine, is the Bible glorified in it? We saw that from 2 Thessalonians 3, 1. Does the so-called Christian music you listen to glorify the Bible? Is it an appropriate setting? Is that music an appropriate setting for the eternal words of Scripture? Or is it like using pornography to teach Bible memory verses? You know, the, the pornography might make it stick, but every time you think of that verse, you're going to think about porn. Is the music appropriate for the eternal holy words of a holy God to man? I hope you remember I gave you a, an illustration that illustrates the fifth point. God is glorified by creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. That's Psalm 19.1. I gave you an illustration about Napoleon and Franz Joseph Haydn, who wrote the great oratorio, The Creation, to illustrate that point. I hope you remember the illustration. Number six, the restoration of the nation Israel brings glory to God. The restoration of Israel brings glory to God. They've been a dead nation for 2,000 years, and suddenly, on May 14th, that's two Sundays from now, that's the anniversary of the birth of Israel, that brings glory to God. 
Thou hast increased the nation, O Lord, thou hast increased the nation. Thou art glorified, thou hast removed it far unto all the ends of the earth. But then it says, the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. In chapter 49, in chapter 60, in chapter 61, the same thing where God says, I will be glorified in Israel when I bring them back as a nation to their land. He's done that. God is glorified. Now here we're starting new material. Boy, that was fast. I moved through 10 weeks of sermons at that moment. <laughs> Last five minutes here. Number seven. Now here's one for you to think about. This is all new material. God is glorified when he judges the heathen. We're going to apply that to music in just a second. God is glorified when he judges the heathen. <laughs> it makes you not want to use heathen music. Now, let me ask you this question. How much modern so-called Christian music speaks about the wrath and the judgment of God? I mean, I'm curious. I don't listen to the stuff, but are there any such songs about the wrath and judgment of God in the contemporary Christian music, the CCM repertoire? Another question. Are they the popular ones that make all the young people wiggle their bodies as the musicians screech, screech and the strobe lights flash, singing about the wrath and judgment of God? Are the judgment songs the ones that you listen to? Because Ezekiel 28:22 says, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Zidon, and I will be glorified in the midst of thee. They shall know that I am the Lord when I have executed judgments in her and shall be sanctified in her. I will be glorified by judging and killing heathen, says God. How many of your CCM songs have that as a theme? Listen to what God says about killing his enemies in chapter 39. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall come, become... And it shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord God. <laughs> a little different than modern so-called contemporary Christian music. How many CCM pieces have that as their theme? Now, you know, there's great music that does have that as its theme. I gave you an illustration about the magnificent Dies Irae, the Day of Wrath, written by Giuseppe Verdi. I told you about that. That music will cause you to shudder and move you to tears as you contemplate the lost being cast into hell. It will move you to desire to witness to your lost neighbors. When you hear that, it shakes you to the core of your being because you know that there are people who maybe live a hundred feet from you who are about to experience the wrath of God. Now, you know, not all appropriate Christian music must have all of the characteristics as we've been talking about. But it will certainly bear some as a sign of authenticity. Number eight. This is also new. God is glorified in the miracles of our Lord Jesus Christ. I could read you dozens of verses. I'll read you just a few. When Jesus performed his miracles, what happened? One, this is Matthew 9, 8. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God. Matthew 15, 31, insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak and the maimed to behold, the lame to walk, the blind to seek, and they glorified the God of Israel. Mark 2, 12, and immediately he arose, took the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. Luke 5, 26, they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. Luke 7, 16, and there came a fear on all, and they glorified God. Luke 13, 13, and he laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Luke 17, 15, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. That's the Samaritan leper. John 2, 11, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. John 11, 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, speaking of Lazarus, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. 
Verse 40, Jesus saith unto her, said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldst believe, thou should see the glory of God. Many, many more verses, but, but you get the idea. When the music truly points to Jesus, it causes those who hear to glorify God, not to feel warm and fuzzy, not to wiggle their bodies, not to go into a da daze in a trance. It causes them to glorify God, to fear the awesome holy God, the majestic ruler of the universe. Application, does the music you listen to make you stand in awe and wonder at the miraculous power of God and give him glory for the gracious exercise of that power toward you in particular in drawing you to Christ and giving you eternal life? Does that music do that for you? Ninth, this is really important. God is glorified when believers bear the fruit of the Spirit. Number nine, God is glorified when believers bear the fruit of the Spirit. John 15, 8. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. You can't put it any simpler than that. God is glorified when you bear a lot of fruit. And you know, Jesus is talking about the fruit of the Spirit. John 14, 15, and 16, the uh, upper room discourse, he gives to us in those three chapters, just before he goes to the cross, he gives to us all nine of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Paul summarizes it for us in Galatians chapter 5, but Jesus actually gave it to the disciples in John 14, 15, and 16. You know, I was in seminary when I discovered that. Nobody ever taught me that. But I, w I worked at a radio station overnight. And uh, I would come, I'd work from like 9 o'clock at night uh, and sometimes 7 till 2 o'clock in the morning. I worked at a classical radio station. And then I'd ride my bicycle through a very dangerous area of Dallas until I got back to the dormitory. I'd sleep for a couple hours and I'd get up uh, and have my morning quiet time. And I got up one morning and I was reading there in John 14, 15, and 16, and suddenly it struck me. It was like, wow, I never saw this before. Because here was love, and here was joy, and here was peace. And so I began to look for the rest of them. And I found all nine, nine full fruit of the Spirit in John 14, 15, and 16. I mean, I was so excited, I couldn't believe it. Have you ever had a moment like that? When without anybody telling you it was there, you suddenly were studying the Scripture, and it jumped off the page at you, and you said, Wow, it's the word of God. I, I mean, I knew the principle from over here, but I never knew that Jesus taught it there. Have you ever had something like that? Oh, people, I've had a few of those in my life. It's the most exciting things I've ever had is where suddenly God opened the scriptures and I understood them. It must have been like the two on the road to Emmaus who had heard about the resurrection and they were on their way home and Jesus came and joined them. And, you know, they said, well, we thought Jesus was going to be the Messiah, but I guess it's not so. And he said, oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have said. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to have entered into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded in, unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they thought, oh, interesting theology, until they sat with him to eat. And he broke the bread and vanished. And they said, did not our heart burn within us while we walked by the way and he talked with us? Dear people, if you study the word of God faithfully, you'll have those experiences where he suddenly opens your eyes to the scriptures. It's not new revelation, it's here. And suddenly, you know you've been walking with Jesus as you studied his word. Oh, that I could motivate you and encourage you to do that. It's the most blessed and wonderful experience. I'm teaching you principles. They'll apply all over life. I'm trying to apply them to, to music right now. But God is glorified when believers bear the fruit of the Spirit. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Yeah, he gets some glory when you bear a little bit. But when you bear much fruit. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. 
So let's get an application with spiritual fruit. Here's a good place to test the fruit of the music you're listening to. Does the music that you're listening to motivate you, or anybody for that matter, to bear the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. Oh, and the last one. Temperance, self-control. Does the music you listen to motivate you or anyone else to bear the fruit of the Spirit? Or does it instead stimulate your libido and motivate you to indulge your flesh, your old sin nature, and to do the works of the flesh? which are also manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you also in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, 20 through 21. You know, these are not irrelevant and petty questions that I'm talking about, but they go to the heart of Christian living. What does the music you listen to motivate in you? Does it move you to bear the fruit of the Spirit, or does it motivate you to do the works of the flesh? Number 10. Number 10. I've just talked about spiritual fruit, now let's talk about spiritual gifts. God is glorified when we exercise our spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are not the same thing as the fruit of the Spirit. For example, in his discussion of the spiritual gifts, Peter says, this is 1 Peter 4, 11, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter's been talking about the spiritual gifts and he concludes by saying, whether you've got one of the leadership gifts, one of the speaking gifts, or whether you've got one of the service gifts, the gift of ministration, the gift of service, both ends of the spectrum and everything else in between, when you exercise that gift in the way that God designed it to be exercised, according to the ability that God has given, do it so that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Okay, so here is another application. We just made an application of spiritual fruit. Now here's the application for spiritual gifts. It's a good place to apply the test of the music that you listen to. Does the so-called CCM, the Christian Contemporary Music, motivate people to exercise the permanent spiritual gifts? I'm not talking about all the, the temporary gifts that were given during the time of the apostles while the, the New Testament was still, still being revealed. The gifts of apostle and prophet, healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and knowledge. Those are the seven temporary gifts. Those are the gifts that were only given when the New Testament canon was not yet complete. The gift of knowledge was the ability to receive a new special revelation and proclaim it uh, to people. The gift of tongues was merely the ability to proclaim it in a language you'd never studied. I'm talking about the permanent gifts, like the gift of evangelist and pastor teacher and teacher and helps and governments and self-control and so on. Does that music motivate you to exercise those gifts or does it stimulate the flesh to try to practice the temporary sign gifts. Those are the gifts of apostle, prophet, healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and knowledge. You know, which kind of music, let me ask you the question this way, which kind of music floods the Pentecostal and charismatic churches? Is it classical music or is it contemporary Christian music on the far ends of the extremes? with the Christian punk rock and the Christian acid rock and the Christian hard rock and, you know, the kind of music that you wonder where in the world did that come from? It sounds like the inside of an automobile engine that's having trouble inside the mechanic shop. You know, if you've been coming on Wednesday evenings, I'm putting in another plug, of course, for Wednesday evening prayer meeting, you've seen literally hundreds of examples 
video footage from charismatic churches from all over the world where the so-called worship music puts the infant believers into a trance and they wiggle and writhe on the floor like snakes. How many of you have been here on Wednesday evenings? How many of you have seen this in the videos we've shown? Yeah, we've got people here who've seen this stuff. I've been doing this for, what, seven or eight weeks now, showing you each different area where that kind of so-called worship music is taking places and leading in believers into the most horrendous heresies whereby famous charismatic preachers like Kenneth Copeland, for example, are teaching that you are a little god, whereby they are teaching you how to channel spirits, whereby they will give you the kundalini spirit, which is a Hindu mystical spirit that comes into your spine, a snake. The kundalini is a snake that comes into your spine and gives you ecstatic trances. And that passes for Christianity. That's not biblical Christianity. Do you get it? You've got to be here on Wednesday evenings. We only have a few more of those to go. But shows these infant believers in trances, writhing on the floor like snakes, barking like dogs, heaping themselves together in piles of men and women wiggling all over each other. Now, is that the spiritual gifts? Is that the fruit of the Spirit? Does the music produce holiness or does it produce wickedness and anybody who comes in Paul says if an if unbeliever comes in and hears you guys all speaking in tongues they'll think that you are mad they'll think that you are insane and yet that's what exa- that Paul tells us that 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, 14 13 is the love chapter in between but chapters 14, 12 and 14 are dealing with the spiritual gifts and he says if somebody comes into your assembly and you're all speaking in tongues and you're all wiggling around like idiots they'll think you're crazy dear people Some of you have let the kind of music that produces that into your hearts and homes. Anyway, that tells you the source when you see the manifestations of the counterfeit spirits channeled into foolish churchgoers and triggered by Baal worship type of music. Number 11, we move down to number 11 now. That was number 10. Number 11, God is glorified when we offer him thanksgiving. God is glorified when we offer him thanksgiving. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound, that means he piles and piles up, redound to the glory of God. The thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Application, moving quickly here, our time's almost up. So does the music that you listen to fill your heart with overwhelming thanksgiving to God? Does the music that you listen to fill your heart with overwhelming thanksgiving to God? Number 12. God is glorified in the work of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the life of the believer. The two things are tied together in one verse. I'll show you in a second. God is glorified in the work of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the life of the believer. We're in John chapter 17. John 17 is the high priestly prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is before his death on the cross and he is praying not only for his group of disciples, but he's praying for those who will believe on me through their their witness. And here's what he prays. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Jesus did what he was sent to do, which was glorify the Father on earth. And now he says, I'm going to the cross. I'm leaving them behind. But I will be glorified in them. They are yours, they are mine. And I am glorified in them. Verse 10. Okay, let's make the application to music. Does the music that you listen to make a credible and authentic impact for the glory of God and those around you in the way that your life affects them. It has to bring glory to the Father and it has to be glorifying Jesus through you to the people who are around you. Does the music that you listen to 
make a credible and authentic impact to the glory of God on those around you in the way that your life affects them. We've talked about this in great detail in the past in other messages not related to music, but how you make an impact every day on the people around you. Your life will make an impact on them. It will either be for the glory of God or it will be for the shame of God. Because people say, he's a Christian. <laughs> Man, I don't want to have anything to do with Christianity if that's what Christianity's like. Music. How does it transform your life to make an impact for Jesus Christ on the people around you? You become a lot like what you listen to and what you watch, like on television, if you happen to have a television, or what you browse on the internet. It not only expresses what you're like because you go to certain sites and, of course, all the different algorithms out there that pick up on that on the internet, they begin to see you look at this kind of site, so they send you little tempters to click on that and click on that and click on that, you know. Uh, and they're building a profile about you till you, they know you better than you know yourself. And the things that you absorb are the things that come out. Junk in, junk out, as the old saying goes. And that junk out makes an impact on the people around you. Does it do what we've just seen here? Does the music you listen to fill your heart with thanksgiving and make an authentic impact for the glory of God on those around you in the way that your life affects them? Number 13. We're not going to make it through the message, but we'll have to close with number 13. We still have lots to go on these principles that when you apply them to music, you'll ask yourself the questions and hopefully get the right answers. Number 13. God is glorified because we're doing all for the glory of God. That includes our music. So these are things that we're told bring glory to God. So if we use music that does these things, it brings glory to God. Okay? Okay. 13, God is glorified when believers patiently suffer for Christ. God is glorified when believers patiently suffer for Christ. 1 Peter 4.14 If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth Just pause for a second before we make any application. If, if the spirit of God and of glory were visible in this auditorium right at this very moment, would the spirit of glory and of God be resting upon you? Or would we see some dark areas in the auditorium and some faint areas in the auditorium and maybe a few brightly shining areas in the auditorium where the spirit of glory and of God was resting upon you. You know, that was what was visible on the day of Pentecost. Talked about the tongues of fire that came down on their heads. That was the Shekinah glory. God was demonstrating that he was moving his temple from the building of stone where the glory of God had appeared at the dedication of the temple in the days of Solomon and it filled the whole temple and it drove the priests out from ministering. There was so much glory there. And then on the day of Pentecost, those flaming tongues of fire which lighted on their heads but did not burn their hair appeared on them. That was the glory of God showing that he had switched temples. No longer was it going to be a temple of stone. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit when you trust in Jesus. If it was visible today, would we see the spirit of glory and of God resting upon you? On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. And that comes when? When you are reproached, they say bad things about you, for the name of Christ. Or as the old saying goes, uh, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? 
For some of us, I'm afraid there wouldn't be enough evidence to convict us of being a Christian if we were put on trial for being a Christian. So let's apply it and then we'll close. Talking about music, applying that principle. Lord, God is glorified when believers patiently suffer for Christ. Question, does the so-called Christian music you listen to fortify you and strengthen you in times of suffering and persecution. Most of us don't know for sure because we've never really had any real opposition because we've always been such cowards when it comes to being Christians that nobody even knows we're a Christian. They might think we're a little odd because we don't, you know, go to the big parties with them and dance naked on top of the table with a lampshade on our head. But if you've ever suffered anything for being a Christian, does the music that you listen to strengthen you in times of suffering, fortify you in times of suffering and persecution? And then on the flip side, does the so-called Christian music you listen to make the pagans around you comfortable or uncomfortable? Does it make them uncomfortable? Are they perfectly fine listening with you at work or on the job or in the car or elsewhere because it's really no different than the music that they listen to? Do they reproach you because of your Christian music or do they just wiggle along with you to the beat? Now, folks, I've been teaching you biblical principles. I've merely been making application in relation to music, asking some pointed questions that I hope you're answering honestly. These principles all apply to every area of the Christian life, not just to music. So if you learn biblical principles and learn how to apply them, you can apply them in every area of the Christian life. I pray by the grace of God that you will. Our gracious heavenly